Welcome everyone, last day SQL bits. I'm sure your brains hurt by now. You know, it's the afternoon. You know, we've got a couple more sessions to go. So hopefully this won't hurt too badly. Um, so my name's Alan Hurt, and for the next roughly less than an hour, I'm gonna be talking to you about infrastructure and really what it means from a SQL Server perspective today. The reason I do this talk is because Years ago, we used to be in a place where DBAs needed to be much more aware of storage and networking and stuff like that. And then we got to a point where people put blinders on. But now as we step into the cloudy world, but also virtual and physical, because I'm going to touch all three, you, we, we're kind of coming back around to where, to a degree, all data professionals need to understand some bit of infrastructure. My goal in this session isn't to turn you into storage or network or cloud experts, but to give you some pointers as to the types of things you're going to need to look at or understand, and then you can go dig in for more information. So a little bit about me, really quickly. I do consulting for customers, which is sort of how I come up with these sessions, because I see these problems at customers. And I've been doing consulting now for over 20 years. I've been working with SQL Server for close to well, long time, since 1992. High availability expert, uh, dual MVP, Microsoft, uh, Windows and SQL Server, as well as a VMware vExpert. So I do physical, virtual, cloud, the whole bit. I'm sure you've seen this a bunch this week, but here is the QR code. I'll put it up at the end. It'll also be in the slide deck for download. So, you know, we appreciate your feedback as speakers. Okay, getting right into it. There are three sort of main general areas on the cover and you'll see there'll be some subtopics within each. Obviously we care about sort of deployment and general performance because that is a big topic for infrastructure. Things like your network speed and your, your IO obviously gate, so you need to think about performance. What does that mean? We're gonna specifically focus on network and storaging a little bit more because those are very core concepts that these days, everybody has to know, even if you think you don't. Okay. PCI Express. Now, quick show of hands of people in the room. Is anybody still deploying physical systems anywhere? No, so, a couple people here in the front. I'm sure there are some online as well. Here's the reality. We have customers that sort of tier. They have systems that are big monolithic systems that don't make sense in some cases to virtualize or put in a cloud platform, at least today. Doesn't mean they couldn't, it just means they aren't or for whatever reason can't. And we're looking now at a couple of our customers who need to deploy some new physical systems. And deploying physical systems has largely become a lost art. And we're seeing it ironically more and more at customers who now need these really big systems and we're getting back to things like system design. And the biggest thing about system design outside of choosing CPU and stuff like that, which I'll talk about here in a few moments, is how they're laid out internally. Because think of this like today, most of you are familiar with the process of you request a server and generally in your environment it'll be virtual, so they give you a VM and that's it, right? You're not thinking about the hardware, how cards are laid out in it, none of that stuff. We used to worry about all that stuff 20 years ago. Guess what, we're back here again. And so for example, um, so I'm not gonna read that slide. Let me, hold on, I need to not show my screen, I need to show this. So, on that side I talked about PCI Express. There are different generations of PCI Express. There's, plus there's also a different speed. You'll see like X1, X2, X3, X4. Basically, that's how much that card can do, but you're gated by your motherboard and your hardware. And this all, to a degree, speaks to things like NUMA nodes. So if you're designing your SQL Server physical system for performance, so this is HP's actual PDF document for, I think, a DL580 Gen 9. D you'll see stuff like this from Dell or any other vendor, so I didn't pick HP because I have a preference they had the diagram out exactly I was looking for. And you need to work with whoever's racking and stacking your hardware and putting things together to make sure that it's optimi optimally put together 
for your SQL Server deployment, because it's the only way you're going to get any performance, right? If you stick like an X4 card for storage in an X2 slot, guess what? It only works at X2 speeds. And again, I'm not going to sit here and dwell on this because you're probably not going to be the ones racking and stacking, but these are the types of things you need to either work with them on or ask the questions when it gets turned over, because if you don't and performance isn't what you're expecting, it probably started here on a physical system that it just wasn't laid out right. You know, and like I said, this also affects how things come in for the NUMA nodes, and these are big deals. And like I said, to me, this has become a lost art because most people haven't deployed physical systems, yet I can tell you as a consultant, I'm seeing it more and more because there are certain systems that are just almost too expensive to either virtualize or put in a cloud, at least today, right? Okay. So that's all I'm going to talk really about physical internal layout. Now, whether you're physical, virtual, or up in the cloud, mem we all know that memory and CPU matter. But the thing about that is, and I'm not going to ask because I probably know the answer, is that based on my experience, not a lot of people continually baseline and benchmark their applications. They'll do it once when they're migrating for a little bit, or they'll do it every now and then, but they're not constantly profiling their systems. The only way to really have the right CPU and know what you need is to constantly look at the tools. It doesn't matter whether you're using like Redgate, you see at the conference, or SolarWinds, um, even if you're using the Microsoft stuff, or just using built-in Perfmon and no third-party tools. You need to understand your usage. Are you a high CPU utilizer? Are you using more cache? What's your workload profile? How much memory are you actually using on your SQL Server box? You know, are you paging out, which you should never see? You know, if you're virtual, are you seeing symptoms of noisy neighbor? And does it mean that either your VM is undersized or potentially, um, you know, like I said, noisy neighbor, like you're just seeing tension from somewhere else. Or it could be that it's sized properly, but you're not getting guaranteed resources. So you need to go back to your virtual team and say, hey, guarantee me these resources instead of saying that I could have them, maybe. Right? And these are all the kinds of things that you need to think about when we're talking about infrastructure for SQL Server. Because this is what gives you your performance, right? Not the least of which, especially in a virtual environment, when you're figuring out your NUMA situation between the physical hardware, the hypervisor, the VM, and soft NUMA that SQL gives you, that's kind of really not easy to always coordinate everything together. So that's one of those things that you really have to bear down on and say, what's going on? Now, obviously, in a virtual environment, you're dealing with the VM and everything under it. But say, in a cloud environment, where you may not have control, you still have to worry about a lot of the same stuff. So up in the cloud, I'm mainly talking about the VMs, which is also known as infrastructure as a service, or IaaS. So if you hear all those terms sort of interchangeably, from folks, that's what we're talking about. Because if you're using platform as a service, so Azure SQL Database, Amazon RDS, you're basically get, just getting like a database or, in like, or in like access to an instance that's already essentially pre-allocated and optimized. You're not going to be able to configure a lot of that stuff. I'm talking about things that you're actually deploying with an OS and SQL Server, and, and you are managing its performance, availability, all that good stuff, right? So a couple of things here. Um, I still get the question, and I have it there in the bullet point. If you're doing especially physical systems, um, or even if you're virtual, you could disable these. Don't disable hyper-threading. It's not a real core. We should all hopefully know that by now, but it still does help performance. From a licensing perspective, Microsoft generally doesn't care about it. Asterisk, I'm not a lawyer, not negotiating your stuff, so. But generally, Microsoft doesn't count that for either looking at the physical side of it. So it really hopefully shouldn't. 
hurt you there. Now, there are some cases where they talk about threads and all this other stuff with multiple VMs. Again, work with your licensing folks, but it's not generally a licensing play. Because again, there are a lot of old myths, like, because there were times in the past where hyper-threading did cause problems, but they're in the distant past. So if you're still seeing problems with hyper-threading, uh, I, I don't know what to tell you there. Um, another big one that's been around for about 15 years at this point, but it's still a problem both on, pre I can't tell you how many times I do an assessment for a customer where we walk in and the first thing that we see on their Windows boxes is that the power scheme is set to balanced. But the, here's the problem. It's not just setting it there. So this basically is letting your Windows throttle your performance up and down because if it's sitting more idle and then it's busy, it, it tries to adjust. But being SQL Server, having mission critical workloads, you want to guarantee that performance. In many environments, this is set by a group policy. So what you'll probably, and it'll, like, that would be grayed out. So what you need to do is work with your internal folks, whoever's controlling that, and say, hey, we need an exception for our production SQL Server installations that on Windows, please make sure that's set to high performance. Um, again, I'm only mentioning it because I still see it way, way, way too much. But here's the problem. That's not the only place you need to set it. If you're using VMware, for example, there's a setting to make sure that each hypervisor host is set to high performance. And you also have to set it at the physical layer, which is the most gating factor. Because I pretty much guarantee you that a lot of servers in your environment were racked and stacked, whether they're hypervisor nodes or not, and they were never optimized from an OS, from an, a BIOS UEFI standpoint. So for example, and again, I just pulled this up because I happen to be doing this with a customer this like about a week ago. On this particular more modern HP ProLiant server, the, it's called the power regulator mode in UEFI. Every vendor has a different setting or set of settings. Some of them will call them like C0 states or C1 states. Basically what you want to do here, really simply, is make sure it's not, like in this case, set to dynamic or static low power or even OS control. You basically want it on at full throttle all the time. This happened roughly 15 to 20 years ago because that was sort of the time when there was a big push to be green and, you know, for IT and servers, to, especially, you know, in data centers that consume a lot of energy, to consume less, which I totally get. I support the planet. Let me be clear. I'm not like a, a kill the planet kind of guy. But for a few servers in your data center that absolutely need the performance, really do this because this will absolutely affect your performance. And said, even up in Azure, they, they set these things at the OS, but you still need to, uh, it, on their hardware, but you still need to set it inside your OS to make sure it all matches. And we've seen this, like, where it's not set, then people go fix it, like dramatic increases in performance. So again, I only mention this because I see this, and then when you talk to the infrastructure folks, they're like, yeah, we never s did anything to the default settings. And, and you can see it in your performance, especially if your performance is kind of spiky sometimes, and you don't know why. It, this could be a contributing factor. So just throwing that out there. And the thing is, when you're, you're testing in, an, in a test environment, like say your physical, your production is on physical hardware, but your test environment's on a virtual. You may see different sort of types of behaviors, but they should be somewhat consistent if all your power settings the same. At that point, it's differences in processor and cache and speed and all that kind of good stuff, right? So. Let's talk about the cloud for a second. Here's the thing about the cloud, and I, I, I saved some of my CPU talk for here. So when you have an on-premises VM or you have a cloud, 
getting your CPU stuff right is hard from a few perspectives. One is licensing, which I'm not going to talk about too much here, but I will just say that licensing matters here. But part of this for me is that, like, for example, if you're up in the cloud, I'm going to show you this in a minute, most of the vendors publish specs for the, a class of VM, and they'll tell you what processor it is. And that goes back to what I said on the previous slide of knowing your workload. Do you need a uh, processor that has a higher gigahertz, like a higher speed, or, or is it a lower speed fine, but you need more cache, right? That's knowing your workload. Just randomly picking some VM type in the cloud, probably not the best thing. And then you're, again, it's the, somebody's gonna complain that performance is terrible, and it's maybe because you picked the wrong VM. Now, the VM type. The good thing about that is you can change that, but that means downtime because you could basically shut it down, change the class, you know. So the cloud is good that way, unlike on-premises where if you size it wrong, you know, like you're stuck with whatever hardware you got. Because that, that's the other thing you need to take into account. When in many environments, not all, because I don't want to do a blanket indictment, a SQL Server workload running inside of a VM is generally part of a bigger virtualization farm. Very, while I do see it, it's rare that in, in most companies that they will either take part of a uh, virtualization cluster, and I mean that from a, say, hy uh, Hyper-V or VMware standpoint, or to have your own cluster of VMware or Hyper-V or whatever it is you're using on-premises to be able to virtualize, just have your SQL boxes there and whatever. So when you're in that general pool, you get whatever processor is on that server. It may not be one that's optimal for your SQL Server deployments, but it's what you have, right? There's nothing to fix that. There's no processor emulation. Turn, turn this into this type of processor, really. There, there, there's no magic there, right? So the, these are all questions you have to ask as you roll out your workloads into production because it will help mitigate problems down the road, right? Even if it's, I know I'm on a hypervisor host that has a terrible processor for me, but at least I know it's a terrible processor, so people come at me and it's documented, right? Because there's no, ma unfortunately I find there's no magic bullet with this stuff. It's really just rolling up your proverbial sleeves. Now, having said that, in the cloud, it's different. Forget the class of processor. So let me just show you an example of that. Do, 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 do. Um, I picked Azure, but again, I could show AWS and you'd see something similar, or GCP. So I picked the, <coughs> excuse me, the EV3 and the ESV3. So no, notice up there, right at the top, they're telling you what these are. So you can make an informed decision based on your SQL Server workload needs if this is the right VM for you. So this is good. This is really good. But here's the thing that I want to introduce. And it was on that slide. And it's, just, it's a concept called quality of service. And it's the same for on-premises as well. Basically, it's a way to guarantee your VM resources, be it memory, CPU, I.O., network. Now, in the cloud, this is built in, because in the cloud, they're telling you if I got, for example, uh, a standard E16 V3, it comes with 16, 16 vCPUs, 128, you can read it there at the bottom, but it's also telling you what your max throughput's gonna be for your disks. And that's gated at the VM level. So one thing that, actually uh, a couple of us were talking about this the other day, sometimes people buy like a, a bigger disk or more expensive disk thinking they're gonna get these massive IOPS. Your VM is gating you. So your, your, VM, your disk may be able to do, let's say, I don't know, 50,000 IOPS. But if your VM can only do 24,000, you're gated by the VM. So everything in a cloud ecosystem has to match and make sense.
Now, the other thing you're going to see here, again, I'll scroll over to the right a little bit. Let me, uh, but it's because I did that. <sighs> scroll up. See, network bandwidth. Again, similar concept of, let's say you have a very busy application, you're running an always-on availability group, and you know you push X amount through your network pipe. Well, you need to make sure that you get a VM that has the right size. So sizing your VMs on-premises as well as sizing your VMs in the cloud especially matters. The problem with the cloud is that now let's take licensing out of things for a second because that's a separate discussion on top of all this. Like if I needed, let's say, nine vCPUs, Licensing, that doesn't match up because you have to buy in packs two beyond the first four, but whatever. I could give a, a VM nine vCPUs on premises. I can't do that here. I step up to whatever the next thing is, and from a cost perspective, that may be a lot more than you want to pay. So there's not that flexibility. Like if you only need four vCPUs, but you need 64 or 128 gig of memory, you're buying the VM that has 128 gig of memory. If you only need eight vCPUs and 64 gig of memory, but you need 100,000 IOPS or whatever. You, you, yeah. And so the point was that it's about disks and allocation too. So if you need a certain number of data disks, your VM size, they're not lying to you in that chart. Like, it is a hard limit. There's no way to fake it out. There's no way to make it work. It is what it is. So you have to be really careful when you go into a cloud, any cloud, because they're all this way. And choose your VM very, very carefully. You, like I said, you can resize. It's downtime, but it's also more money. Very now, the other aspect of that is you can cost your company a lot of money if you didn't base on a benchmark and you buy a big honking VM and you're using maybe a tenth of it. I've seen that too. The problem is, is when we did that on premises in the VM, we generally didn't care because we could do what we want with it. Up here, it's costing you real money. So be very careful, all right? That, that's just my general thing. Now, the other thing about this, too, is depending on your configuration, and I talked about this in my uh, training day on Tuesday, um, and I talked about this in my HA talks, things like where you put these things matter. For example, if you're doing an always-on availability group on-premises with VMware, and it's a two-replica configuration, that means you have two VMs, you'll need a minimum, if you're using vMotion and you have the licenses to do that, you'll need a minimum of three hypervisor hosts to do that. Because you need to set anti-affinity to ensure, at the hypervisor level for the VMs, to ensure that those two VMs can't live on the same host. So that means if you're using vMotion, well, if one of these is going to move, can't move here, so it needs to move here. Your infrastructure folks will hate you because that's not how they design their VMware servers. That's not what they want. I've had these conversations a lot, and they don't. It's, a, it's just a thing, right? Your SQL Server architecture now dictates how things are laid out on your hypervisor host. In the cloud, it's not dissimilar. All the, all the clouds have the concept of zones. So for example, if you're deploying VMs, you might deploy them to different zones for availability purposes so that if you lose a zone, you can flip over. Or in Azure, we also have the availability sets, which is something slightly different. That's more like the rack layer kind of thing. And, and like, so zones basically is different things in the same region, whereas an availability set could be in the same data center kind of a thing. And you'll see the other thing about Azure is that different features may exist for zones, but not for sets and vice versa. So. How you deploy your VM in Azure it depends on what features you're using, too. And then it goes down to what region has the features you're looking for. So all these little weirdnesses in sizing, slotting, placement of, and these are all, again, 
not things that when you're remote desktoping into a box that's running SQL Server or administering it remotely, you're not thinking about any of this, but this is all the work you need to do to get to that point to administer that SQL box. So be aware of all this, because these are, again, core infrastructure concepts that you may not directly implement, but will impact you severely if they're done wrong, right? And like, for example, like in all the clouds, if you wanted to be in availability zones or, or a zonal type of thing, you can't bolt that on after. Like, if it's not done at VM creation time, you basically have to destroy it and redeploy or migrate your stuff, and you don't want that either. So what you're probably going to need to do for all your cloud deployments is have like a checklist that's specific for cloud, have a checklist that's specific for VMs, just so that all these little types of things that crop up, you can go back and you can push back on your infrastructure folks to stop deployment of SQL Server until these things are fixed. Because once they're out in the wild, uh, chances are you either can't fix them or they won't be fixed. And hopefully you had that process for physicals back in the day, but not everybody did. Oftentimes it was, oh, let's throw it across the wall, we're done with it, and we never see it again. And then you're left s dealing with all the badness of their bad builds. Okay. So one thing that <clears throat> I do like to point out is that in the new world, networking is at the top of the food chain. So for example, in all, in all the cloud uh, implementations for VM and whatnot, with rare exceptions, all your storage is network-based. You know, how things talk to each other, network-based. How are you getting from on-premises to the cloud? It's network. So data professionals can no longer bury their head in the sand that networking is something they don't have to think about, right? If you're using always on availability groups, networking matters. So I'm not going to explain this because this is like computer science-y stuff, but I put it here just to sort of show you what happens. If you're dealing with your on-premises network folks, you'll, and this is the main reason I put this slide in, is that column to the left, <clears throat> you'll hear them talk a lot about layer three or layer four switches. That's where they're thinking. Like, so I've been in meetings at customers where they're asking the, you know, the database team, well, is this layer three or layer four traffic? And you could see just the, the glaze come over people's eyes, you know, of like, what is that? So that's what they're thinking about, right? And then if you go across, you can just see where it maps to different things. So basically what your networking folks are trying to figure out, is this externally facing or is this internally facing? And how do we route this network traffic on our own internal networks? That's all they want to know, right? Because you're not getting a, all right, let me take that back because some people probably will say, well, I do. But most people are not getting their own dedicated networks just for SQL Server. You're, you're sharing your network with everything else. So all your general traffic, even if it's sectioned off, is still going through the same pipe, right? So this becomes more important if you just think about this as like your 50,000 foot view, okay? Now, the thing that you have to reconcile though is everybody's measuring networking different and this is part of the problem. Right? So if you go into Perfmon, and let's say you're running an always-on availability group, you're trying to measure, you know, you can see how, how much your data is going across the wire for your AG, but you then need to compare that with the network counters to see what else might be going on on your box. Then you need to know the speed of your network, and are you getting even close to that? But all, the may, all those counters, at, they all might be in something, one might be in megabits, one might be in megabytes, one might be in gigabits or gigabytes. So you're going to have to do a bunch of translation between what the network card is rated at, what your network's rated at, what the Perfmon counter is saying to come up with, what are we actually using, what's our actual speed of what's going on? So it's a, it becomes a math problem, right? So you have to do a little homework on figuring out 
this stuff. And again, this becomes more important as we push more data across the network. Now, let me also give you a sort of, all right, well, I'll go to the next slide and I'll, I'll talk about it more. So when we're talking about hybrid architectures, especially cloud or even cloud, like region to region or cloud to cloud, which is also hybrid, all cloud providers don't care about ingress. Ingress is taking things into the cloud. Anytime you take stuff out of the cloud or to a different region or to a different cloud provider back or back to on-premises, you're paying for that. And that all requires that it's not only cost because you're using network, but you've got to figure out what bandwidth you need. Like, for example, if you're doing a migration from on-premises to one of the cloud pro providers, straight IaaS, let's not even get into, like, you're just taking on-prem and moving it up there. Okay, great. You use log shipping or distributed availability group, backup, copy, and restore. You got it up there, you got it synced. Then you go, okay, do we want to, for a period of time, reverse that flow so that in the event something gets borked up in Azure or AWS, we wouldn't be able to fail back on premises easily? If the answer is yes, that means if you have a very busy application, stuff's going to be flowing this way now. It's not flowing this way. And this way, you're paying for it. And that your company might not be expecting. So be very aware of these types of things. Or people are like, you know, We'll throw some reporting stuff up in the cloud, not thinking that people are doing these really horrible queries and pull down all this data and then they get a bill and they're like, what, what happened? Well, welcome to egress. So you have to be very aware of these kinds of things. Now, when we're talking hybrid architectures, the first thing we need to worry about is how we get to there from here, right? Let me give you a for example. Microsoft, Amazon, all of them have their own, shall we say, direct link from your on-premises networks to the cloud. Azure is express route. They all have a similar name. Cost money, and again, you can buy more. The more you spend, the more bandwidth you get, but it's a direct connection. Your only other way to get from on-premises to the cloud would be to be like a point-to-point -point VPN, that kind of a thing but then you're gated by your internet speeds. So if you have mission critical applications, you pretty much need one of those direct things. That's not something you guys are setting up, but you need to know that it's reliable and fast enough for what you're trying to actually achieve. And you need to ask these questions because people have this very pie in the sky look of, okay, we're just starting to do our migrations to the cloud or do DR in the cloud and not think about how you're gonna get from here to here. Because what I always tell folks is that the way Azure or AWS or GCP have to work for you is like an extension of your on-premises network. Now it'll be in a different subnet, meaning the IP address scheming might not be the same. So now we're getting into routing issues, okay? How do I get there from here? Do the, where am I putting things like DNS? Do we have redundant core infrastructure like Active Directory domain services up in our cloud provider? And, and we're not just going back down on premises and reaching through, causing delays and having issues. Because you certainly don't want your only DNS servers down in Earth data centers, physical or virtual. That's just bad mojo, right? I can't tell you how much in the past two to three years with customers I've, di I've, I've spent looking at DNS and routing issues because of things like this. So if you're terrible at multi-subnet, on the ground, you're going to be very much more so in the cloud. Because, and I see that a lot even with like data centers, you know, like we've got a data center in New York and we've got one in London and, you know, everything's terrible and it disconnects all the time. Well, if you can't do that reliably, how are you going to get it right to the cloud? And as data professionals, again, that's nothing we set up, but everything we do is dependent on somebody else setting up that network infrastructure correctly. Period. Like, I'll give you another for example, another cloudy for example. Um, so just again, quickly looking at Azure, is it like in VMs, let me get to do, do, do network interfaces. So everything is obviously a software representation. This is a network card, okay? 
Now, on premises, again, if you're setting IP addresses in a VM, you just go into the VM, set it in the OS, and you're done. Well, up in all the clouds, where you set that is actually here. And inside, it looks like DHCP, or basically it grabs an automatic IP address. And I'll, I'll do zoom it real quick. I said it's static here. And the thing is, this is fine, but somebody needs to know to do this when you're, and have a process to do this. Because if not, they're setting it inside, and then if somebody spins up another Azure resource and it doesn't know about that 25 address, you're going to get an IP conflict. And what makes this worse is even if they get this right, if you're deploying clustered resources, let's say an availability group listener or a failover cluster instance, or Windows Server failover cluster, it knows nothing about those IP addresses. So, you've, so whoever's deploying stuff in your cloud provider has to be really careful about what IP addresses they're using and keep track of all that stuff, of what is known, unknown. Nobody, nobody wrote the manual for this stuff because this is how you run your business every day. But I could tell you, you at some point you will have an IP conflict and it will hit a critical resource and you want to avoid that. So again, it's nothing you guys can do from a database perspective or a SQL Server perspective. It's just something you need to know about so that when you're deploying these things, somebody somewhere is accounting for all these moving targets. And this is the stuff that slows down deployments. Like it's not deploying an AG, it's not deploying an FCI, it's getting all this core infrastructure right. And on top of that, for example, like in Azure, I always recommend setting up network security groups because you can set up, like, for example, like all, what ports are open, what ports are not open. You don't want to set this on every individual virtual NIC card, but somebody's got to figure this out and get this all set up. Like, this is not your job, but you need to make sure it's done because it affects how these things are running. And this is why I'm showing you, so you can go ask these questions or poke around in Azure to make sure that it's right. Um, you know, you can set firewalls. I mean, there's all, like on your virtual networks, all this stuff, everything we did on premises has to be done right in the cloud. The cloud isn't just a, oh, let's just go to the cloud and everything magically fixes itself. Most of the customers we work with that help tra that get transitioned to the cloud have what I call a teething process. They work on some of this stuff, they get what they think is the right stuff, they deploy in production, then change a whole bunch of it <laughs> that they realize wasn't quite working for them or whatever. Sometimes you get 90% there and you're only making 5 to 10% changes and that's cool. You don't want to be making a ton of changes like you, like you missed a whole boatload of stuff. So make sure that your network folks, like, like this isn't just some initiative that somebody said, oh, hey, we're going to the cloud and like magic fairy dust and sprinkles and it's all going to work. It will be painful for you. Trust me, I've seen it. I'm trying to make that not happen, happen for you. Um, you know, if you're deploying availability groups or FCIs in the cloud, there are two ways that they can be done, but there's stuff that needs to be happen at the Azure layer, or even in AWS, there's a different way of doing this where you put IP addresses on the, v the VNX. But depending on how you do things in Azure, one way to do it is you set up a load balancer so the listener or the FCI can fail over between the nodes. Again, this is something you're probably not doing. This is fully well documented in Microsoft stuff, so I'm not saying stuff that you can't go Google or Bing and find. But this now needs to be part of your process that wasn't on-premises, OK? And you just again, this is conversational stuff that nobody thinks about when we're trying to transition our normal skills to some cloud-type architectures. OK, so I've talked about most of this stuff. Uh, the only other one I'll say is sometimes you want to know like, what the shortcuts are. Because sometimes you'll see it as like a slash 24 or slash 16. Sometimes you'll see it as other stuff. 
just be aware that some different programs and different documentation refers to networks in different ways. That's just sort of classes of how the network thinks about itself and how it deals with IP schemes. Um, and, and, and limiting ranges of IP addresses too. So again, there's a lot of reasons why they do this. Make sure your networking team kind of communicates this stuff to you. Um, we've talked about most of this to a degree, but the goal is to have good performance as well. I'm not just in that, that was sort of that VM sizing and slotting thing. The one thing I will, the two things I will definitely point out here is that use the right stuff. So if you're virtualizing, because I still see people get this wrong, do not use the Intel NICs with VMware. Please make sure that your virtualization administrators are giving you VMs with VMX Net 3. Net, um, VNIX, if they're not, politely slap them upside the head and uh, tell them that hasn't been the best practice for about 10 years. Um, the other thing about that, and especially in a virtual environment, like the VMware tools get updated all the time and part of that are those network drivers. So please make sure that stuff gets up to date, okay? Okay, with a few minutes left, I kind of want to focus on storage. I'm not going to read through these because we pretty much know who they are. These are more reference. But there is a difference in the type of storage that you use, not only in terms of reliability, but also in terms of speed, form factor, density, all that kind of stuff, right? So that's more just that slide, not gonna read it. This slide matters more because now we're talking about how are we connected to our storage, right? And I've seen no endless permutations of storage being configured improperly. Um, could be that the wrong queue depth. And by the way, queue depth is still a problem on virtual machines as well. So your PV SCSI adapters for uh, VMware, which I actually I think I have on the next slide. But so always also, by the way, in VMware use PV SCSI adapters, so power virtual SCSI adapters. There is a queue depth on there. And if you, and sometimes you have to tweak those settings to get optimal performance. So again, maybe nothing you would do, but somebody else, you need to work with them to make sure you're getting the right throughput on your VMs. If you're using network storage, all the network stuff I talked about comes into play on premises. Now, for, I've already talked about this, but let's talk about storage virtualization really quickly. And another thing I want to mention, which I don't have in my slides, but I remembered I probably should have put in there, is deduplication. So I'm just going to say it right now, you're not going to win that battle, generally, because most storage devices today do deduplication, period. Basically, 30,000 foot view, for those who don't know what deduplication is, is if you've got six databases that all have the same data, it's going, well, this is all common, so I'm not going to store like six copies of it. I'll, we'll kind of condense that down. That's great for storage space. It's great for a bunch of other stuff. It's not good for things like availability. So number one, as an availability guy, if your storage stuff does deduplication and you're putting like availability groups on top of that, like if you have two replicas that are virtualized, even if they're sitting on different hosts, if it all points to the same stor storage system underneath, that's the illusion of availability. So those two VMs would actually need to be on hooked up to two different storage subsystems to truly have availability because there's no deduplication going on. So these are the types of questions you need to ask because again, the illusion of availability versus the reality of availability, two very, very different things, right? But then there's another factor in some of these virtualized storage, and what do I mean by that? So in, there's a concept of hyper-converged on-premises, so things like vSAN, Nutanix, um, a bunch of these vendors are doing things where basically compute and storage are converged, hence hyper-converged. Oh, no. So this happened the other day. I, I think it's a problem with, with drivers, so I'm just going to speak to the storage. I'm not going to bother rebooting my laptop. I did it in the other day. So when you have storage, like imagine these are like up here would be your servers. You have storage, 
and hyperconverged basically does de uh, uh, all of them have this concept where to be redundant copies of that data might be stored in either multiple places or the same data is copied to let's say all the nodes in some way so that's not always the most efficient but it creates redundancy which is great for most other types of servers except SQL Server. So when you lay down things like always on availability groups on top of that, you're getting like redundancy on redundancy. So some of the hypervert converged stuff, um, you can tune, but it's usually at the hyperconverged layer. So you need to know what kind of duplication factor, it's called various things in different, it is happening underneath the covers, right? Because you, you, there might be more work going on, and, you know, and then the question is, do you need an AG? And maybe you still do, maybe you still don't. We have customers that fall in both categories, where they have hyperconverged platforms and still use AGs just great. But some of them may have other limiting factors, because like some of the platforms, for example, will store the disk writes in a different place so they can be distributed out, which will, can, they, can then impact performance. So a lot of factors outside of SQL Server now and your VM even affect your performance and availability. So again, stuff you don't, can't worry about, but at the same time you have to worry about, all right? Um, can't show it because my laptop la locked up, but from an Azure and EC2 and just general infrastructure perspective, doing things like making sure you get the right size disks, because different ones, ha like, like in Azure, like a P30 or a P40, they have different sizes as well as speeds. Now, the other thing I was going to talk about and sort of show you, but I can, is that sometimes you can buy like an ultra disk, for example, in Azure, that's a one big honking disk. But it might be better in a lot of these cases to buy a, s a bunch of smaller disks and then stripe them inside the VM to get the capacity and performance you need. So from a cost of whatever ratio, it might be better to get different stuff than just the natural instinct of getting one big disk. The other thing about all the clouds, by the way, is ex except for like sometimes one or two things, none of the storage is local. The only storage that's generally local is what's called an ephemeral disk, which means quite simply, it's a temporary disk. Do not ever, ever, because I've seen people do this, could, put your user data, SQL Server databases, whatever on there. Somebody in the audience here is laughing. Because the thing is, the ephemeral storage is, your fast, is generally your fastest storage attached. People go, oh, it's the fastest stuff. We'll use this disk for SQL Server. It'll be great. The, about the only thing you could use it for, if it fits your needs, let me put the big fat asterisk there, is TempTB. Because obviously, as we all know, when you stop and start SQL Server, 10 PB goes away and restarts, so who cares? But for your user, n please do not use the ephemeral disks. I, I, I've, had, I've seen sad trombone incidents of customers who made some assumptions about how all that worked. Please don't do that. So with that, I'm just about at time. So I will be stick around a little bit for questions. I know somebody's coming in after me, so I'll probably move to the back of the room and order the community zone. Um, the deck will be uploaded, so you can grab that as well. Or you can ping me with, through email or Twitter or whatever for questions. Please, I can't show it, but please fill out your evaluation form. And thank you so much for attending. Have a great rest of bits and a safe trip home.